This is the Brave Ideas Podcast, brought to you by Aqua. I'm Dan, I'm a strategist here at Aqua, and I'm joined today by my co-host. Hi guys, I'm Varushan, I'm Head of Analytics at Aqua. The Brave Ideas Podcast is all about bringing to light innovations in the realms of digital and marketing. And we're joined today by Celso Borges, Creative Director for Interactive Design here at Aqua. And he's also currently the runner-up in the Aqua Table Tennis Championship. Celso, what's new? Well, I actually want to chat to you guys about a a topic that I've been thinking about for quite a few months now. It's called, you know, designing for the future. That was something that I actually got from um, a guy that was presenting at the Design in Darbo last year. And he's a architect slash designer from Sweden. His name is Neil Sorensen. And he was talking about how he designs for the future as an architect. And that kind of got me thinking about how designing for the future then applies to us, you know, and applies to what I do as a trade and, and my team and stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah, so that's what I wanted to chat to you guys about. And then, you know, I kind of have this little um, rabbit hole that I go down into in- with regards to, you know, what possibly that future looks like, you know, because how do you predict what the future looks like in five years time? How do you predict what or how people are going to engage with, you know, technology? Uh, what kind of connectivity is going to is going to be available and what can be possible through that? You so, know, so what does designing for the future even mean? So what Neil Sorensen means with that is, you know, it's about scalability, flexibility and adaptability because the because the landscape is forever changing. And so the idea that he has, you know, and because he, he designs primarily airports and substations, you know, and his projects take like three to five years to be constructed and to be complete before the first person actually goes through it. So. When he so starts to think, so he's going to think of what the future looks like right now. Right now, exactly. So when he puts, you know, his pen to paper, he has to think about how are people going to interact with technology in five years' time. What is it going to look like? How does it feel? What does it sound like? How are people are, are, are going to interact with uh, transportation? What is that going to feel like and look like? And you know, how readily available is it going to be? And and all of those kind of things. And those factors, you know, it's it's difficult because you don't know. You only know what you know now. You can pre- perhaps predict a trend, you know, and you can go into futurism and technologists all talk about futurism and things like that. And you can talk about things like um, in our industry would be the, you know, the, the next 5,000 uh, days of the web and things like that, you yeah. know. So, so it's about, but, what, but the way he ends off, really, it's, it's about creating a structure or a system or something that is flexible enough, that is scalable enough, and they can adapt quite easily to what the user requires instead of creating something that is solid and fixed. And I think that's, that's the beauty of it is that, or that's how you would apply it really, is about creating something that is user-centric and that is flexible because you don't know what the user behavior is going to be like and that's what you're trying to cater for. So if I'm, so if I'm understanding what you're saying, basically you're saying that for user interaction design, what we need to now consider is five years ahead as opposed to... The, the current day. So, I mean, that's very interesting for me. And, you know, there's a famous theorist. I mean, he's a marketing guy. His name's Gary Vaynerchuk. And he says, you've got to market in the year that you actually live in, as opposed to marketing in the past. So I'm quite interested to know how far behind do you think, you know, design is or our clients are relative to this sort of mentality? Yeah, well, they're not too far behind, only because we're starting to see a trend now where clients or brands are coming through and starting to request a more user-centric approach to their brand, to their offering, and to their digital properties. So you have, you know, um, um, brands changing the way that they do their information architecture on the web, you know, on their websites, that we're deploying new sites and new offerings for them. But what we keep telling them, and, and I think this is what's starting to sink in, is we tell them that if we had to reverse engineer your product, will it be a reflection of your internal structure? If so, it's not user-centric. And therefore, you're designing for yourselves and not for your users. And it's all about the user. That's, ho- that's what the whole yes. thing about, you know, being flexible to adapt to the different behaviors that, that we have to encounter. And so, so that kind of takes me back to, you know, the, the early days of UX and usability and where it started, where essentially website IAs would be laid out in essentially the way the organization structure would be laid out, yeah, you know. Exactly. Navigation menus would point to the exact departments that existed in an org structure. 
and, and you know i think you know maybe we've done a, a, a bit of a bad job in kind of convincing people that that's the way it should have been laid out in the past saying that though surely you know we need to consider the type of industries and the markets and and the type of design that we are approaching when we look five years into the future because in some areas architecture for example you can still quite accurately predict you know how consumers will behave or how users will behave with that kind of architecture in five years but for the web you don't even know the technology that exists would yeah. would an html5 platform for example still be around in five years yeah well and that's the thing you won't know because uh, how long has it taken for html5 to get to where it is now where we've been saying oh it it'll never replace flash you know and things like that so eventually there's this kind of a crossfader that starts you know swapping the previous technology out and and the new one in but at the same time that the new technologies fader is already starting to move and and there's always that you know very dynamic very fluid landscape that we have to try and and work with and that's a thing if whatever you're doing is not flexible or scalable enough yeah. to be able to adapt and move quickly and and realign with what is what has become the new thing or the new world you know then then you actually falling behind so hold on so let's bring it down to the layman cuz i'm struggling to digest all this technical gobbledygook um i what i really want to understand is practically how designing for the future should manifest in the work that anyone at aqua can do i mean what what do we do, what do we take out of this conversation yeah well i think the so, so it says you yeah. were asking for an explanation for dan here <laughs> yes yes I, I i think the layman here <laughs> is really daniel okay well, so daniel uh, <laughs> no well i think you know we're, we're already starting to make progress in in this path okay um things as simple as um responsive web layouts okay so that arose from the requirement of users wanting to consume content on their devices that they that they carry with them instead of only at on the devices that they have at work or only on the devices that they have at home so there's the, that user requirement and the technology was then uh, you know it then evolved to the point where it was now it's now flexible enough to cater for all types of screens you know what i mean so a single requirement um uh, kind of uh, uh, will generate that this entire flood of okay this is how we're going to do it now and now responsive layout is just a common thing you know it yes. used to be a buzzword now it's how can you not do it because you you have to look at your market you have to look at the fact that mobile is massive even even when iOS 7 released a, a do not disturb feature for example you know so that we start to see designs that are more perceptive about the real world and and start to become more contextual about what the user needs but it's not just about that it's also about when the user needs it why the user needs it and all of this kind of always on ux systems like like you know google now and so how that works internally is that we need to start thinking like that we can't think that uh, one of our customers users will go on to their website and they must then just absorb brochureware no the the website must understand if there are a returning user are they a customer do you know what content have they interacted with can we promote certain content content based on something that they did 3 weeks ago do we know who of their friends are doing the same kind of interactions or performing the same kind of actions and can we leverage off of that and that that kind of big data mm. you know idea where we now start extracting that information that is so vital to understanding how we design for that flexibility and that's in terms of the interaction design team that's what we try to focus on we don't just okay well here's a website and thank you our job is done as like no the website going live is actually only the first step now we actually provide a platform mm -hmm. where we receive users input and that's essentially what the website is for and that's how google now gets to do such a great job because it's always listening for when daniel leaves at half past 3 to go home yes so do you leave at half past 3 to go home as yes okay. um <laughs> <laughs> and it will tell you how long it's how long you're going to take to get to home you know what i mean brilliant. it's that always on ux and that's that paradigm shift that we need to start thinking about yeah. so, so what can we do to be ahead of the curve Well I think a massive um benefit for us would be to start educating clients it would be to start taking them through this idea that you need to start designing for the future it's to take them through the idea that their business needs to be more user centric that it's about the users and it's not about the product managers that are sitting internally it's because the user doesn't care about that limitation that the business is talking about that prevents us from 
going ahead with this technology that might solve not just the one problem but many and the user might have a, a major experience kind of uh, a new experience that they then will want to return or promote it or speak about it you know and then more clients will come through and i think that that education layer is 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 it's our duty to provide that because we are the ones that are meant to be thinking about these kind of things and so we need to be able to inform the clients so so just to throw something in there and that will be great to get your opinion on mm-hmm. this as well what you're saying is that we should be getting way more interested in user centric front ends and and, and yeah. platforms and kind of tools which kind of moves away from you know a five year view from having any any kind of brochure way appeal uh yeah. saying that you know do you see the 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 front end and the and the the tool you said space totally user centric at the end and then what is the place then for brands to actually market themselves in terms of their brochure way and and their advertising yeah look i mean i think the you know the landscape is changing completely like you know to brands even it was a website even a brand's home anymore is uh, the big question i've got you yeah, know sure. social media yeah. has taken on a lot of the ro- the role yeah. of being that sort of key interaction and engagement layer so you know i think you've got to understand the consumer context before you, you know before you can actually design for the future and one of the key things is really to consider the con- the consumer's usage and digital usage and digital behaviors before you can practically plot what the future looks like so you've got to un- unpack those trends At the end of the day people may not even use the mobile web to get information from brands they may simply refer to social channels it may simply be about user friendly snapchat experiences for example you know so you know i think that there's a there's a fine line and i think it's the combination of technology changes but also the competition of user and consumer context that will define what designing for the future truly looks like yeah i mean we we presented last year to one of our clients to to kind of give them a glimpse of what we think their their brand should be like in the future and by in the future we mean just in 5 years time for example so not even in in 20 years time and essentially we gave them as a, a a snapshot of how we think brands are going to exist and that brands will have less space to exist but customer experience will have a lot more of a platform you know you see um phones where the branding of the phone is left to the back of the phone and not to the front so it's not always in your face the screen real estate is used to you know is maximized to improve the experience not the brand because the experience becomes the brand and that's what the, you know the brands are on are starting to understand that that's what they need to own it's that experience but that experience is what users are experiencing their users and that's where that user centricity is coming from yeah. you look at um for example the, we, what we showed was this mock up of a a a concept art for for twitter right and when you go and we showed this this user journey where when the user decides to use that app that there's a massive twitter app icon yes so there's where the brand shines through even though it's in a micro formatted space mm. it's still shining through the user presses that there's a landing screen that's where the brand shines through but as soon as the point of the app loads the branding then takes a step back because you've already dis- you've already made that decision the brand has done its job it's brought you to that app now it's about what experience can that app give you and i think brands more and more will start going in that way i think if they wanting to own that user centric approach you'll see it in, in so many even movies where one of the major telephone uh, uh products that you see in a movie is a Cisco um IP telephone right but now in movies like minority report and the island you'll see that they have these you know um video conferencing where there's actually no brand there there's no yeah. logo and why it's because when all the hardware eventually peaks at the same point when everyone can offer the same level their brand it needs to now focus on what experience they can give to the user yeah, it's about the utility right exactly yeah, sure. and that's that user centricity that's that that's about putting the user first and understanding what their needs are like you were saying and reading that data so it does talk to big data yeah. and and gearing your brand towards that and i think that's the, the that's the snapshot or the picture that we need to paint for our clients so thanks sel so that was a great discussion um if you could, if people want to get a hold of you or find out more about this topic what can they do well they can uh, contact me on uh, my email address here here at aqua so 
So it can be a Celso B, that's C-E-L-S-O-B at aconline.com. And yeah, any questions or any kind, you know, open up a chat line or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, with regards to this topic, I can talk about this for days and hours. Because, I mean, it, I think it's a really exciting topic for me. So yeah. Cool. Great. Thanks for having me. So let's move on to the tool of the week. Okay, so the Tool of the Week is a really exciting segment and what we do is bring to life, um, you know, something useful or a cool app or something interesting in the world of digital. And this week, I'm going to talk to you all about Meerkat. So Meerkat is the latest hot trend from the South by Southwest uh, event in Austin, Texas. And it's an app. And what this app allows you to do is live stream directly from your phone to Twitter. So your followers on Twitter will be able to watch your live streams no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing. So I think that what's really interesting about that is that it really changes the game in terms of live events, in terms of product launches and in terms of lectures and how you can bring those to a mass audience and really putting that power into the hands of a consumer who's using their mobile device. So I think if you want to download it, you can find it on the iTunes App Store or I'm sure Google Play as well. And you can download it and play with it and see what it's all about and how it works. Cool. So that concludes uh, episode two of the Brave Ideas podcast. Um, Thank you very much for all the guests and join us next time for episode three.